This is one of the most common presenting problems, neurological presenting pro problems uh, in an acute hospital. So I'm going to go through um, the underlying pathology and then the clinical features of stroke and TIA and the diagnosis and management. Okay. Many of you, if you, if you look in the textbooks, will find this definition for stroke and TIA, um, which is uh, it's actually still quite a good definition to remember. It's not quite so accurate now that things have moved on in terms of diagnosis. But the key points in terms of what stroke is, is that it is a sudden onset neurological deficit of cerebrovascular etiology. And it's a sudden bit, which is important. So when you're taking a history from a patient who presents with weakness or slurred speech, the key point in the history which you want to um, elucidate is whether it was sudden onset. Stroke as opposed to TIA. Um, classically, the difference here is purely one of time. Stroke symptoms persist beyond 24 hours and TIA um, less than 24 hours. In practice, I would say that that's not such a use useful um, time cutoff. Uh, because things have moved on in terms of therapy with thrombolysis, and I'll, I'll go into that a bit more later on. What causes stroke? The majority of stroke, 80%, is ischemic, caused by atherosclerosis, um, and 20% um, of stroke caused by a bleed. I'm going to focus on ischemic stroke, atherosclerotic arterial disease. Well, we went through this in length last week, so I'm not going to go into in too much detail, but... Um, it's, it's so important. I think the majority of disease burden, if you exclude infective causes, is down to atherosclerosis, whether it be heart or uh, brain or the limbs. So this can either be thrombosis or embolism, uh, as we discussed last week. And in terms of embolism, it could be of cardiac origin uh, due to AF, as we discussed previously, following an MI, uh, infective endocarditis, or a prosthetic heart valve. Other rarer causes, which I wouldn't worry about, things like vasculitis, sickle cell disease, um, I, I wouldn't worry about too much. I just remember thrombosis and embolism. Hemorrhagic stroke risk factors are hypertension. Uh, AVM is uh, arteriovenous malformation, uh, which is where you get communication between the arteries and the veins within the brain, which is susceptible to bleeding. And then substance misuse like cocaine, um, amphetamines, and obviously trauma. So just as a reminder from last week, what is going on? You have an atherosclerotic plaque. Eventually, as the atherosclerosis worsens, it increases in size and ruptures. And this causes thrombus formation with platelet deposition. And that can embolize into a distal vessel and block it. And if that vessel becomes blocked, then whatever tissue is supplied by that vessel, unless the blockage is removed, it will die and cause infarction. Same principles for the brain as for the heart, as we went through last week. Right, classification of stroke. Don't worry about this bit on, on this side. Let's talk about this side here. This is one um, of many ways to classify stroke. This is called the Bamford classification. And this is looking at the um, symptoms and signs, the clinical presentation of the stroke. Why is this useful? Well, it helps you determine the underlying anatomy, which blood vessels are affected, and the severity. There are four types here, posterior, lacuna, total anterior, and partial anterior. Let's first consider posterior. Posterior cerebral infarction is caused by disease in the vertebrobasilar circulation, so the vertebral arteries and the basilar arteries in the back of the head. And that results in problems which affect the occipital lobe and the brainstem. So you might have cranial nerve deficits because um, all the cranial nerves arise from the brainstem. Uh, or you might have a uh, sensory motor deficit because the motor and sensory tracts run up the brainstem before they go to the cerebral cortex. Or you might have problems with eye movement 
uh, or cerebellar signs because you have um, the, the cerebellum affected. Okay, the next three, lacuna, total anterior, and partial anterior, are caused by problems with the carotid circulation, the anterior circulation. How do you work out the differences between these? Well, there are really three possible components you can get. You can get a problem with speech um, or a problem with uh, complex movements, apraxia, inability to do things, uh, or a problem with neglect. And neglect is where the patient's vision is actually intact, but they selectively ignore a particular field of their vision, even though they're able to see it. Secondly, you could get a homonymous visual field defect, and that, in um, contrast to the neglect, is actually a problem with the optic radiation. So the patient is not actually receiving any input from the uh, retina. Or you can get a motor or sensory defect in the face, arms, or legs. So those are the three things which can happen. And it's very simple. In total anterior, cerebral infarct, you get all three. In partial, you get two out of the three. And in lacuna, you only get one. So that's how you remember that. Easiest way of remembering that. Clinical features. This is absolutely key. Sometimes you'll be able to get the history from the patient themselves. However, if they've had a severe dent stroke, you will rely on uh, witnesses or the family. As I said earlier, sudden onset. Is, is the very important feature of the history. Any of these, weakness, dysphasia, dysarthria, loss of vision, or sensory deficit. Now, dysphasia and dysarthria is something which used to confuse me when I was a student. What's the difference? Well, dysarthria is more of a motor problem, that you're having difficulty forming the words, whereas dysphasia is, is difficulty actually producing the stream of words, and that could be expressive. So you are unable to actually produce the words, um, the stream of words which form a sentence. Or it could be receptive, where you've got the opposite problem. You're, you're unable to um, uh, comprehend and make sense of, of a stream of words. The next point in the history is to work out how the symptoms have progressed. Are they still there when you're seeing the patient, or have they completely resolved? And how long has it been since they started? And then you ask about vascular risk factors, um, and that is what I went through in the, in the previous session on ischemic heart disease, hypertension, smoking, hypercholesterolemia, family history, diabetes, all of those things. In the past medical history, AF is very important because that's a risk factor for embolism. Diabetes uh, greatly increases your risk of stroke independent of any other risk factors, whether you smoke or not, or have high blood pressure, diabetes in itself will. And that's poorly controlled diabetes. So you wouldn't need to ask the patient about uh, what, whether, how their diabetes is controlled and how well it's controlled. And any pre-existing um, atherosclerotic disease, whether that be in the heart or peripheral circulation in the leg. A drug history and social history is critical. Because as well as the immediate management of the patient, you need to think long term in terms of rehabilitation and uh, the functional deficit which the patient has and how they will be able to cope as a result of this in their home environment. On examination, neurologically, you need to examine the limbs and establish um, the pattern of weakness as Ed described earlier. If the patient is able to walk, um, it's helpful to see if they've got uh, any difficulty walking, not, not only from the neurological perspective, but how will this patient be able to mobilize um, having had the stroke? Will they need any walking aids? Will they not be able to mobilize at all? It's very important. And then the cranial nerves, in particular the facial nerve, the facial nerve supplying uh, motor function of the face. And you want to look for um, upper motor neuron facial nerve weakness and to do that, you look at the eyebrows. If the patient is able to raise both eyebrows, but has a unilateral facial nerve deficit in the lower part of the face, then that's indicative of an upper motor neuron facial nerve lesion 
which is likely to be due to stroke. Right, one, one point uh, which can catch you out uh, and can be quite difficult actually in the acute stage is that um, immediately after uh, uh, getting a stroke, uh, having uh, infarction, you may actually find that the tone and reflexes are reduced rather than increased. As the stroke progresses and becomes more dense, you then get the hyperreflexia uh, and increased tone and the uh, clasp knife uh, uh, tone. That tells you about the neurological deficit, but what's more important is to know what's caused the stroke. And to do that, you need to look um, at systemic examination. Are they in AF? Do they have signs of carotid stenosis? Um, this is not particularly reliable, but if you listen over the carotids and they have a bruit, so uh, they have a harsh sound during systole, that might indicate carotid stenosis, uh, which if they've had an anterior circulation infarct, uh, could indicate disease in the carotids causing that. And then signs of systemic atherosclerotic disease, do they have uh, signs of peripheral vascular disease? Right. How do you manage uh, ischemic stroke? Whenever you get asked in an exam, how do you manage anything, the first thing you say is you stabilize the patient and resuscitate them, ABC and all of that. Um, the key to effective management of stroke is to recognize it early on. Uh, and you may have seen in, in the press adverts uh, trying to communicate to the public about what stroke is and how to recognize it quickly. Uh, the one which uh, is advertised to the public is this FAST test, face, arm, speech, and time. If there's any problems with the face, arms, or speech, time is how long it, it's lasted or when it started. Uh, Rosier is another method which some hospitals use, uh, uh, and that's uh, just a questionnaire looking at things like uh, weakness and speech deficit and duration, these type of things. The duration is important because that can affect management. Uh, you may be aware that now uh, we're trying to get more and more patients thrombolized who have ischemic stroke. If they have um, symptoms of less than three hours in duration and there aren't any contraindications to thrombolysis, uh, you can do an urgent CT scan. If you exclude hemorrhage, the patient may be able to receive a thrombolytic drug uh, like autoplays, uh, as is used in uh, cardiac uh, thrombolysis for uh, MI, and that can greatly reduce the disability following stroke. Ongoing management uh, is looking at trying to establish a cause. So you investigate to look for uh, AF, you do an ECG, chest X-ray, uh, could the patient have had a chest infection as a result of aspiration pneumonia because of a problem with their swallow? as a result of the stroke. Uh, blood tests, full blood count, renal function, clotting, glucose, and lipids, particularly looking at uh, vascular risk factors here. The CT scan, which you need to do urgently, is to try and distinguish if the patient has had hemorrhage or not. If the patient is in AF, um, I won't go into any of this. This is what um, Ed mentioned earlier in terms of further management. Uh, and then carotid dopplers to look if the patient has carotid stenosis. If they have significant carotid stenosis on the same side as the um, cerebral lesion, uh, and that means more than 70%, then having an endarterectomy could significantly reduce the chance of having further events later on. Breaking down the management, supportive management and pharmacological management. So you need to do a swallow assessment early on to see if the patient is at risk of aspiration. And if they are, they might need an NG tube and fluids. Pressure care. If the patient is unable to move their limbs, they'll end up sitting in bed in the same position for hours on end. And it's very important to have good nursing and move the patient around to reduce the risk of having pressure sores, which can become infected. Physiotherapy, occupational therapy are key to improving morbidity after stroke and improving function. Pharmacological management is looking at reducing risk, vascular risk. If they're diabetic, then optimizing the glycemic control. TED stockings, uh, that is more to do with reducing the risk of thrombo, um, uh, of DVT and PE. Uh, use TEDs only in the initial stages, not heparin. The reason why is because having had an ischemic stroke, 
puts you at risk of having hemorrhage, cerebral hemorrhage. And you want to reduce that risk uh, by ensuring the patient isn't anticoagulated. So you don't use heparin initially. Blood pressure management. Um, it's important to remember in the early stages, the first 48 hours, the blood pressure may actually rise quite significantly. And this is a physiological response uh, in order to improve the circulation to the rest of the brain, uh, which is potentially viable. So you want to avoid uh, treating that with antihypertensives in the acute stages to reduce the risk of an extension of the infarct. And then further management, antiplatelet agents like aspirin and a statin. Now, thrombolysis, I wouldn't worry about too much. Uh, this is just for interest, really. But the same principles apply to stroke as they do to uh, myocardial infarction. And that is, if you're able to reperfuse the blood vessels which are affected, that greatly improves the outcome. And the sooner you do it, the more likely you are to reduce the disability following stroke. Um, if you are able to get to the patient before uh, the three-hour time limit, this is the number needed to treat, and that is um, a statistical number, a hypothetical number of patients you thrombolize. If you thrombolize six, one of those patients will have complete resolution of their symptoms and no functional deficit. Now, this uh, picture here just illustrates what I'm talking about. This is an MRI scan. Uh, and illustrates a concept called the penumbra. In ischemic stroke, you'll have an area of the brain which is dead, which has become infarcted, and there is irreversible damage. There's nothing you can do about that. That is indicated by this white area here in the diffusion-weighted scan. However, you may also have an area of the brain illustrated in the second picture here, which is ischemic and at risk of uh, becoming infarcted. The third picture shows uh, MR angiography illustrating a blood vessel which is blocked, the left middle cerebral artery, causing all of this ischemia. If you're able to thrombolize a patient, you still have that area of infarct, but that area of ischemia has completely disappeared. And you can see here, the uh, middle cerebral artery is now perfused, and that will prevent any further functional deficit as a result of the infarct. So that is why people are so excited about thrombolysis and the potential it has in the treatment of acute ischemic stroke. Um, again, just for interest, you don't need to memorize this, but uh, suitability for thrombolysis uh, is basically if they're within three hours, you do a CT scan to rule out hemorrhage, and if they don't have any contraindications, um, and there's a huge list here, um, as a junior doctor, you actually won't have to worry about this because thrombolysis is dealt with in specialist centers and you'd have to be a stroke specialist to actually give thrombolysis at the moment. Now, transient ischemic attack, the underlying pathology is exactly the same as stroke. You get, you get um, a disruption in the vascular supply of a part of the brain causing the same clinical features, uh, but the WHO definition is that you have complete resolution of the symptoms within 24 hours. Now, 10 years ago, I was giving the same kind of lecture. This would have stopped there, and I would have carried on any further. Because traditionally, people used to think a transient ischemic attack, that's not a problem, because the patient gets better. There's no need to treat it. If there's one thing you remember about TIA, TIA is not a benign condition. The reason why is because if you have a TIA, that greatly increases your risk of having a full-blown stroke. The way to identify people who are at risk of having a stroke when they've had a TIA is to look at the ABCD2 score. I'll come on to that. And that tells you their risk of having stroke and how aggressively you need to manage it. Those who are at high risk of stroke should be aggressively managed to reduce risk factors. And these are the same um, risk factors which uh, you should look for in all patients with atherosclerotic disease. Smoking, you've got to stop them smoking. Antiplatelet therapy to reduce the risk of thrombosis. Glycemic control uh, if they're diabetic. Cholesterol control if their cholesterol is high. Blood pressure control if they're hypertensive. And as I mentioned earlier, 
uh, carotid endarterectomy if they have carotid stenosis, and anticoagulation if they are in AF. These are just the, the features of the ABCD2 score. And um, it's quite easy to remember. Don't worry about the actual score itself. It's more uh, just to get an idea of the component of it. Uh, and the components are age, if the patient is old, blood pressure, if they're hypertensive, the clinical features, so that is what they presented with, and weakness is worse than speech. So that's what you have to remember there. And the duration. Um, the longer it, the uh, symptoms have lasted, the more likely they are to have subsequent stroke. And diabetes puts you at increased risk. And this slide just illustrates the risk of stroke depending on the ABCD2 score. And this is, is very important to note. Someone who has um, all positive on ABCD2 uh, scoring, 8% of those will have a stroke two days later, which is why it is so important to uh, manage these patients effectively who've had TIA. So to summarize then, uh, what causes ischemic stroke? Either thrombosis, uh, thromboembolism, uh, so that's plaque rupture and an embolus, cardiac embolus, uh, for example, from AF, Hypoperfusion, so they have global um, uh, underperfusion of the brain. Clinically, um, how does it present? It's sudden onset neurological deficit. How do you investigate it? Resuscitate the patient and then do an urgent CT scan to rule out hemorrhage. If you're within three hours and uh, the patient has not had a hemorrhage, they may be eligible for thrombolysis. And then you go on to do other investigations to look at the cause of the stroke. And then to remember that TIA is not a benign condition. You need to really aggressively treat people with TIA to reduce their risk of stroke. Okay, that's it. Are there any questions? No? Okay, great.